Do it. We were. We will. How's the levels? I think they're great. Good. Welcome to another episode of Comedy Wham Presents with me, your host, Valerie, coming to you from Moon Tower 2018. ComedyWham.com is your place to go for features about all Austin comedy and those passing through Austin. We bring you articles and podcasts featuring the best in Austin comedy in all its shapes and formats. Started in 2016, the podcast project brings you funny people and their stories. As a fan, I like to delve into a comic's background and motivations and will usually take a detour along the way. Consider the interviews a way to, for you to get to know the folks that make the Austin comedy scene one of the best in the country. Deep breath, everyone. Today, I sit down with what, for many of you, will be a familiar voice for fans of Bob's Burgers. He's a perennial favorite at Moon Tower Comedy Festival, and every year at the Just for Laughs Festival in Montreal, he delivers his state of the industry, a biting, incisive look at the state of comedy. He's made countless TV appearances, and for his wild and chaotic stage presence, he wouldn't have earned all of those film credits if he wasn't one of the hardest working comics in the industry. He's one of the best comics to follow on Twitter. His high profile shade of a certain British superstar has become <laughs> legendary over the last year. And for the record, as if my opinion mattered, I fully side with our guest on this one. And now I am beyond thrilled to welcome to Comedy Wham Presents our guest, Andy Kindler. I love that introduction. Oh that made, made me excited and uh, <laughs> it's like, wow, who, who does she have on? <laughs> what I was saying. At that point. No, I just say I'm going to eat things, but yeah. I won't eat now. Go, no, you know, go for it. Just You don't want a coughing guest. No? <laughs> no, I've never, in fact, I, I can either eat or act. I can't do both. Yeah. So, it's always a problem. Because uh, well, it always bothers me in soap operas when they don't, when they don't ch close their mouth when they chew. Oh. <laughs> not, but now, Ricky Gervais, I think the whole world agrees with me now, I'm hoping. I was ahead of the curve. I, I think there are some people that are still fighting it, but no. Well, no, the I, people who love him. Yeah, the people are, who love him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But his last special was so awful. I had to back off of, of uh, interacting with him because he really kind of got under my skin, mm. and he was like uh, very effective at it. <laughs> he really is. I mean, he's just. He's a troll. Just, he is a human he's an troll. He's a troll. Yeah. 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 Who it happened is, to do The Office years ago? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but his office was great, but since then he's become just a jerk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I play a, a, a movie game with, with a friend of mine, and we just watched uh, we just watched Muppets Most Wanted, which he's in. Right. And it's like because I, you know, I'd written this ahead of time, and I, yeah, saw, you know, came on the side of, of Andy on the on the big debate. I'm like, oh, I really don't want to watch this movie. <laughs> How was the movie? You know, it's, it's a Muppet movie. What right. can you say? <laughs> I would say that Ricky Gervais could ruin a Muppet movie. <laughs> Tina Fey, however, is in it. And so that, you know, counteracted. Makes it, yeah, yeah. And but. yeah. Um, the thing that he, if you see his last special, though, it's so, it's so clear. Like he, he does a whole thing about Caitlyn Jenner and it's all trans. Yeah, it's, he's like, it's like, he's like, I'm not, it's like basically he's not afraid to go after trans people. I mean, what is his point? Yeah. You know, his yeah. humor is based with his trans humor is based on oh what you you know make up your mind what you what's your sex gonna be yeah. it's like so it's so like f trying to find the last group that you can mock you know yeah as opposed to just uh writing some material yeah. the, the way i described it and i clocked out after about 10 15 minutes of, of watching it oh you tried is, to watch it i tried to watch it yeah and this was before i i was i actually just recently started listening to your podcast Oh, or, thought or, spiral. Yes, yeah. yes. So I didn't really have the full take on, on that you had. You know, I had I just, just been watching the the Twitter right uh, feud uh, drama, and my thought was, man, this is really mean spirited. Yes. And there's, as you know, as the person who does the state of the industry, you know that there's there are there are ways to attack somebody without necessarily being mean spirited. Right. And as a fan, I'm not saying that I'm an expert analyst on this, but that's what I honed in on is, oh, this is just mean spirited. I love it when somebody attacks. Like a, for as an example, a big J.O. person. Oh man, yeah. he will go after somebody, but I've never thought he was mean spirited. Well, he's a, he's a, a, a stand-up comedian. Uh, Ricky Gervais is ah. not a stand-up comedian, and I'm not an elitist, so I don't believe like 
I never, I like, I always have tried to treat new comics with respect. Yeah. Like, I don't try and do a, a, a hierarchy thing. But he is not a stand-up comic, which would be fine. Yeah. Anybody should try it. Sure, sure. But he starts to, he he starts to to uh, do it, and then he gets into this whole. He's the greatest stand-up comic of all time, and he creates these venues where it's just an echo chamber yeah. of people cheering him on. There was nothing even remotely like stand-up about that, about yeah. that show. It was just like, you know, with it was his, a bad uh, TED talk. It was a bad TED talk. So, <laughs> it, it, and now I'm never going to be able to interview him. Oh, you wouldn't I want to. Oh, you really wouldn't want to. Uh, uh, oh, but I do miss the old office. Obviously. Yeah. Well. Despite all of this wonderful chatter, uh, I actually want to focus on you. Why not? Yeah, right. right? Time to focus on me. I know. Uh, And I I like to ask the same question of my guests. That's fine. Beginning and end. So first off, to start off, my icebreaker, one word to describe your past. Wow, that's a tough one. One word to describe... uh, Mm, up and down. <laughs> of course. Mixed. <laughs> ambivalent. Uh, yeah, that's a rough one because the past is a whole that's a whole kettle of yeah. kettle of the past. It's it's fascinating with the interviews that I've done. People really get tripped up by I know because they think, yeah. Oh man, and then their whole life flash must I imagine their life flashes a I think people just start to wonder like what is it, yeah, they, it brings them to the brink of self-exploration. Self-expl- yeah, yeah. <laughs> because this is a fan uh, interviewing a comic podcast, I want to know what your first or earliest comedic memory is. My, uh, well, I have two comedic memories. The fir- I have a comedic memory of me being funny in a car. <laughs> At like five years old, and I mispronounced the billboard, and the whole family laughed. And I was like, "Oh, that felt pretty good," you know. Yeah. Um, my first earliest memories of, uh, I, I think the first things I watched though were like, um, do you say memories of comedy? Comedic memories. Oh yeah, it's very open ended. Probably, ja- yeah. I mean, I watched uh, Jackie Gleason. I watched, uh, uh, I watched Ed Sullivan, but I, I'm too. I'm not young, but I'm too young to remember the acts on Ed Sullivan. Sure. Uh, and I was really, lo- I, from an early age, I loved like uh, sitcoms, like uh, Mary Tyler Moore, and I loved Dick Van Dyke. And so I guess that would be my early, I didn't like the Three Stooges. Uh, so I never watched four yeah. comedies. <laughs> okay, that's, that's an interesting thing for you to point out because I saw your show last night opening for TIG. Right. And How was Tig? I had to leave. <laughs> yeah, she was fantastic. Oh, yeah. she, she stopped trash talking you. When she well, no, she knew I left. Yeah. 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 Oh, did she make one more reference to me and I was gone? <laughs> she might have, but you know. <laughs> I, I had to go imagine. do the other show. I, one of the best pictures, I happened to be in one of the front side rows. One of the best pictures that I have that I've already posted is of her chasing you around oh, the stage. She comes out to me last night. She goes, Maybe I should chase her around the stage. She's so <laughs> the funny. Thing. I think she's yeah. my favorite person. I can't think of a better person and or funnier person than her. Yeah, yeah, w- uh, yeah. It, it's too bad she only did the one performance because it was. Oh, she's great. in for one night and left. I think so. Yeah. She's unbelievable. Yeah. She is a per. I would like to have her approach to her to my career. Yeah, yeah maybe I'll do one. You know, it's like. Yeah. She's kind of the confidence that I've always lacked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And that's very much uh, your your persona on stage. I, talking to you here, I don't get that sense that you're really, you know, lacking in confidence. Well, I'm not lacking in confidence right now, but I have. I'm aware because I'm in therapy. Finally, as what my whole family said, finally, uh, I'm aware of when I feel uncomfortable. So I almost always feel uncomfortable and I never thought this until I had therapy because I, I I always think I have to I think I have to perform you know what I mean so it's like and there's nothing worse than a comic when they're on all the time but I tend to be good at being on in a hopefully funny way but it still gets exhausting you know and so some I'm always thinking what are people thinking of me like I got a, a drink before, 
and uh, I mean, I was going to get his coffee, and the, I used to be a bartender, so the bartender didn't even like acknowledge that I was there, and uh, I kind of got mad about it, but then I was worried, like what, uh, you know, what, what people would think about me getting mad, so, and then, because it's not, because there's a part of me that's like, you have to be a nice person, which I really, my parents drilled into me, and a lot of it's good, I'm not a mean, like I'm nice to people, but it's a lot, it's exhausting to try to uh, make people like you all the time, especially since I have that other side where I'm constantly saying negative things about uh, Ricky Gervais. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, because I kind of want to say these bad things and still be loved. Yeah. Well, this this podcast will get twenty listens, so you can. That's what I was hoping. That's the anybody. only reason why yeah. I did it. I. Yeah. I think that's why Bruce. And thank you to Bruce, by the way. Bruce Smith, uh, Bruce Smith we're talking Smith, about. Omnipop. He's nicest not your. Guy. He's not your father's Bruce Smith. I don't know what that means. <laughs> But yeah, so you know, feel free. This is this is this can be the state of Austin, very niche comedy industry. If you want it to, I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I, I actually want to close the loop on my my little three sure. stooges observation because you, I, you seem so gregarious and you know just dramatic and and very three stooges. Uh, Epic is the word that I'm. No, thinking. I don't think so because uh, Three Stooges was like, um, I, it's like they're hitting each other. I don't like that the hitting and the. You know, yeah. and the yeah. I never loved that as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I used to do a joke. I said I, I find out what I found out why the three, why women don't like the Three Stooges. They're not funny. That's why. <laughs> but I, I I actually accept like I I'm, uh, Drew Friedman is a great. Uh, Illustrator and writer, uh -huh. he he grew up loving the Stooges, so I I get how people did love them yeah, as kids. Yeah. It makes sense to me because mm -hmm. there was a certain craziness about it. Yeah. So the anarchy part fits, but I'm more stream of consciousness, anarch, anarch, anarchistic. Can I ask of like when you are doing your shows, is it? Is it really stream of consciousness? You know, that's, that's like the worst question for somebody who's a No, that's fan. a good that's a good question. Uh, you know, it's like Because they're, they're just so I lay the ground. Yeah, oh, there, sorry. there are people that <laughs> that make the observations that the mark of a great comic is somebody that makes it look like it's purely stream of consciousness, but you know they have written it down to the last Yeah, now detail. I would say if I knew that a comic was framing his material because I actually make fun of comics in my act who are like, uh, use tricks, like, oh, 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 here's another bit I've been doing for 30 years I'm going to make sound like it's off the top of my head. You know, so it's like, uh, uh, what did you ask me? I have a problem. I have two problems. I have AD, uh, I'm talking about this on stage, I have ADHD and I have OCD and I'm on Prozac, which has been great. I recommend everybody, <laughs> please, people. Uh, but I, my short-term memory, and I smoke pot. Not today. <laughs> Not today. That's a new thing, right? I mean, I was. Uh, <laughs> I've spent. Uh, I've hit, I have to hide to hide my receipts from my wife because I'm spending about two hundred dollars a week on legal pot. Uh, well, the funny thing is, Andy, I'm very. Uh, I will lose track of things, but at you some haven't point, though. I didn't the, think you. The, yeah, oh, you I'll, remember? I'll eventually, stream it that's all. Good. Together, that's good. That's a good. That's a good. <laughs> a skill for an interviewer. So uh, the question was, are you really that stream of consciousness when you're on stage? Now I remember, yeah. Well, uh, the, I guess I wanted to address the thing you said before. I'm not a fan of when they try and make it look, right? Mm -hmm. But I think also people could get fooled, not fooled, but they just, they don't think of it as being written. When someone's really good, like uh, Maria Bamford, she might do both, uh -huh. but she's so comfortable. Yeah that, you know, it's just, she's able to convey her voice, uh, you know, and so here's the way it is on stage. I actually, this was a, I actually had like a, a panic attack, not real panic attack, but I left my comedy in LA. I have my comedy all written on index cards and I go over them like crazy before the show. So I had to introduce people last night at my own show and he gave me a uh, he gave me a card with the intro on it, and now I have my index cards back. <laughs> but uh, what I try to do is, I do everything from alphabetically thinking of the bits I want to do in my head, so I don't forget. Uh, think you know, try to stay in the moment of what's happening. You know, I'm working on a current amount of bits, but then when I get on stage, I really 
I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, it, it is stream of consciousness um, in terms of how I put it together. Mm-hmm. And uh, any asides I have, you know, are definitely going to be just in the moment. But uh, it's a difficult thing because I have memory. I have memory problems. And I, I actually... Uh, Went for a long time where I wouldn't take any notes at all on stage because I just like was going to see if I could do it. Yeah. But now, like, I'm thinking, I see, you know, it's different now. It used to be, they would say to the, the, oh, he doesn't have his stuff memorized. But now people know that comedy is not memorized. So. Yeah. At what point did you, sounds like you may have started your comedy career where you did memorize things and then you stopped and now you're back, but a little bit. Well, I'd say it's this. It's like, uh, were you at the TIG show? Yes. Okay, did you did you know I had notes on the napkin or you thought it was a napkin? Yeah, I thought it was a napkin. Yeah, see, like, everybody, I'm friends of mine, comics, always have something. Yeah. Not always, but they kind of disguise it a little bit. Yeah. My thing is, I don't kind of want to disguise it anymore, but I'm glad you didn't know they were notes, and I didn't really look at them. They were just uh, yeah. comfort there. When you first start, you couldn't even... When I first started, I started... They wouldn't even be thinking about... Because no, I'm part of the alternative movement where that's what we did. We brought up our notebooks and stuff like that. Yeah. But when I first started, I wouldn't even know... I would have known you couldn't do that. And so I would have had to have memorized it. But I've always had m- memorizing problems because I don't like an, I don't like an act that goes linearly and that's constructed together where this bit goes to that sure. bit. When I say I don't like it, also, I, I can't write it that way, so it's, it's, it's convenient that I don't like yeah. it. But I sometimes won't even see the most obvious connections between two jokes because I, I'm not used to doing it that way, uh, like into you know themes and thing and uh, like a through line to yeah. it. So yeah. you know. So now I, I want to chase down another thing because you've got an acting career. Hey, thanks for saying it. <laughs> I didn't ask you to say it, but I it, it works. I, I do my research, Andy. Uh, you have to memorize things. You're telling me you have a memory problem. I have Why a problem you... when I act, too. Um, here's what I'm What I'm What I'm learning is I don't think it's Alzheimer's. Thank you. I don't think it's a dementia. I don't think it's anything like that. I think it's nervousness. So when I get on, like, I had to act... I'm on this show called I'm Dying Up Here, which is on Showtime, mm-hmm. and, I, and I'm playing an agent, and I had to be, like, uh, in a steam room. I'm calling someone from a steam room, so, like, I'm not naked, but I got a towel over me, and it's, like, all these... It, it, I, the, my call was at 3 in the afternoon, but they sometimes they don't sh- know what they're... Sh- sometimes they just can't shoot it the way that they planned it, so I didn't end up shooting it until, like, midnight, so that got me more nervous of these lines I'd already memorized. Ah. So then when I get into the room and I'm worried because, I, you know, it's like I don't like people seeing my, uh, I know the ladies love it, <laughs> but I, my upper body should not be exposed. And so I'm worried about that and I'm worried about if people can see that. Like, can they see, uh, for example, if you're a man and you're getting a massage, you don't want people to say that they admire my breasts. Right? That's not the kind of compliment you're going I, for. No, I don't know. You never, you, you never think of steel, these. No, you never think no. of this when you're younger, though. I'm telling you, it's only when men get to be uh, my age and they look down, and they go, "This can't be, this can't be uh, God's plan," or I guess it is God's plan. So what happened when I act is, I because I have this uh, the attention deficit thing. Uh, I kind of like psych myself out from remembering my lines, but then sometimes I'll get in a nice groove with them. And then on the set that last time, I was like, the first couple of takes were really, I couldn't remember anything. And then when I, once I relaxed, I was able to remember it. Yeah. But I, I don't have a photographic memory. So like you the line- work hard at it. Well, it's the, no matter how hard I work at it, it seems like if it's a long scene, you almost have to start doing it to get it down mm-hmm. because it's like you may have memorized it four hours ago now it's nothing but now some yeah. people have like you know like I say some people yeah. have no problems with that yeah. I feel like I've jumped way ahead by talking about your acting career see because you're you doing would... stream of consciousness yeah, exactly but you I 
pre you, presumably you started as a comic. Well, that would be a, a, an incorrect presumption. Okay. I like that. <laughs> I like that you use presume, and I like that I one up you with it. Yeah. I don't really. I, you know, I don't think presum presumption is a one up so much. Putting it on my bio, I was one upped by Andy Kindler. <laughs> I I started as a musician. I was oh, a musician. Yes, I knew this. Yeah, I was a musician in college, yes. and I was in bands and. I stumbled into comedy because a friend of mine who I was working with at a stereo store, he wanted to try it, so he asked me if I would try it, and uh -huh. then, I, I, then I fell in love with it. So, uh, But you were saying presumably? Yes, presumably, uh, when you made a shift, because you did right. do comedy first, what was it like for you to go into acting? Oh, well, here's the thing is that... <laughs> Um, since I've been a little kid, or like summer camp, I did plays in summer camp. I was in a, we had a thing in high school called Sing. Nobody knows what it is. <laughs> well, some people know what it is. It's regional. So it's like the junior class puts on a show, the senior class puts on a show. Okay. And so, uh, and when I was in summer camp as a kid, I was in every single, I, I played Elwood P. Dowd and Harvey and all the. So I really did a lot of theater just as a kid and then okay. in college I did a lot of theater because they because uh, it was upstate New York at the school called Binghamton and it was I just had and it was just a great experience yeah. but I never have had the uh, confidence uh, that I uh, acting mm -hmm. and that is because um, through therapy I realized that I'm so concerned with if I'm good enough sometimes uh, and I'm, you know, like, are, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Does that, do they like my acting? And that doesn't normally happen with stand-up because I'm very comfortable with myself yeah. with stand-up. But acting is still, even though I've done a fair amount of it, still kind of new for me. So that actually has made me make a break, great a breakthrough with acting yeah. auditions, because really for acting, it, it's it's just to get out of your own way. The more you think about, like, I try to turn everything now into the grist for the mill. So if I'm nervous as I'm acting, I try to put that into the character, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. But uh, I always think like when you see these people who are amazing actors, that they're always amazing actors. But when you, you hear a lot of these uh, people want to close uh, close sets, I think De Niro and the, like, like if you ever see, see De Niro talking a regular read off a teleprompter, it's like he, he's obviously shy or something like that. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, uh, comedy was easier for me to progress in because I, I didn't, I wasn't mean to myself. Mm -hmm. That's my whole problem is I've been mean to myself. Yeah. And, and, uh, not that's my whole a, problem, but. That's a fairly common trait of comics. I think so, probably, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you tried to, if you tried to make a, a profile of a comic, I think you'd find many things that would fit into the profile, and then you'd find some things that, that don't, because some comics are just extremely happy. Yeah. You know, like they're, they they're, 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 their private life is happy, and they're hilarious, yeah. you know? So it just depends on, on uh, what your thing is. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go back again. You can do whatever you want. I Every, know. To I, me, I can't sense what the, what the direction it's in. <laughs> is I, that a good thing? I, I mean, well, it's yeah. not. I'm never, <laughs> to the day I die, I'll never be a, well, I'm, I'm hoping I don't die, but I'm never going to be one of these beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. Like when I tr if I try and write a script, I can't, I just don't think that way. Yeah. So I don't so think that a, way would stand up either. That's a skill that I need to work on because I'm, I'm a mathematician. So Are you really? So everything has to be linear <laughs> and yeah, she knows. Are you a mathematician? <laughs> no. I love that you're a mathematician. <laughs> now, if a man like me wanted to start back with math again, oh, just don't. can I stay away from cosines? Can I sure. just lock it down with geometry? You Nobody know, uses calculus for anything. It's is that true? It's geometry and algebra is everything. Oh, okay. Well, I am mixing up algebra now. Because yeah. I think algebra I'm not good at either. Uh, <laughs> How about algorithms? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I, it's computer science. I pride myself on being good with words. Yes, you but, are. And I just said you that are. to make you say right. that. But I have no idea what a, a past participle is. Yeah. I have no idea what a subject of a sentence is. Uh -huh. I know when it's wrong. Yeah. Like the predicate. What is, what is a predicate? Can, I'm a mathematician, Oh, you're a mathematician. Andy. That's right. <laughs> 
exactly yeah, you, how I you, get out of every That's argument. why you, you can't come up with a unified field theory because of your, uh, <laughs> you know what it is, but yeah. you can't, you know what it is as you an equation. can't articulate it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am. I, I don't know. I am, I, I'm. I'm fascinated by math because I, math, I think, is a really. Sp I believe in this, a spiritual universe, which many people don't believe in. But you know, when they're, you know, a lot of times in in, uh, in physics, they're going. I know how to explain this math wise, but I don't know how to explain this people wise. But math is behind so much stuff mm -hmm. that uh, I, w I hope to take a course. Yeah. <laughs> Biggest pet peeve is when people tell me, oh, I don't need to do, do math at all. I'm like, well, then how do you leave a tip at a restaurant? Right. And not only do you say that, but I feel lucky that I really was good at like a. Uh, Dividing things, or eight times six, seven uh, times nine, because I can figure out a tip so fast. Yeah, and same. what I do, I double, I double the amount and move the decimal point over. Hell yes. Thank you. Yes. Is that how you get twenty percent? Yeah. Pretty much. My, Except people my go, tactics. you don't have to do it. It is pre-tax. <laughs> don't hang out with those people. Pre-tax. Yeah. Thank you for not tipping me on the tax. Yeah. A lot of weight people will say that. I admire that you separated the tax yeah. from the service. <laughs> but I'm pretty good. Like, well, you know what else I can do? I can add up a lot of numbers in a row pretty good. So I'm practically that guy, like that guy who has autism who can do pie. I'm practically like yeah. that. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Are you he does pie up to... Uh, yeah, saying the decimals. There's a, like a serious competition for people who can do that. Say he the also, uh, he oh really? Yeah. Well, it's an infinite number, right? Right. But he went to Reykjavik. Is that Iceland? Yeah, Reykjavik. Reykjavik. He learned to speak. It's supposed to be the, the hardest language in the world, or one of the hardest languages. Mm -hmm. He learned to speak it in one week. This guy. Oh, I God. want his skill. Yeah. But I want my uh, warm personality. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're on your way, yeah. Andy. I think you can. Well, now that you told me that I could be a math whiz without, uh, what was it? That I don't need calculus. Cal Is calculus no. dead? I, no, not okay. at all. But I just don't think in the practical world you really need. But calculus. scientists mostly use. I think it's statistics. Ah. Um, so that's, but that's a different field than geometry and, and yeah. algebra. But you know, day to day. But you know, what I love. I love the way we. I love the way we've summed up in life. Where we go. <laughs> we go. I remember years ago they go, well, how do you do? How's it? Go, oh, it's all done by computers. Oh, okay. Well, now we understand. It's like people don't really know what they're saying, yeah. but it, or they go, it's all zeros and ones. Yeah. I really don't. I know that what that means, mm -hmm. but I don't know how you get from there to a screensaver. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I think I kind of because my wife's a photographer, so she explains things to me sometimes yeah. with the zeros and ones. Yeah. Can I say one of the things that, that I, that I really say. like about uh, your podcast? And actually, you, you, it happened in the show yesterday, but you, you bring up your wife yes. every single time. And I just find that really charming and, you know, it's, it's Well, that's because I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a player, you know what I mean? <laughs> like the comics on stage used to, like in the A's, they go, yeah, hotels are crazy. I'm staying in room 1275 of the... Of the the Weston, <laughs> but it's almost like she's a, she's part of your act. Yes, and, and the, she's also yeah. very funny, and she also, yeah, she she also corrects my act because oh. uh, I have a tendency in life to think I've given the the preface, you know, I've given the background to something I'm saying, and I haven't. Mm -hmm. So she's like, so you never said this in the joke. You know, yeah. so that they can't possibly know. Yeah. And normally, I just blame the audience and think, <laughs> what could I have done wrong? I'm perfect. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, but I love my wife. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and, and yes, it is. As I've been going through more therapy, I've been talking about her more. But I check everything out. I say, uh, everything I say on stage about her, I check it out first. Oh, nice. Because, uh, uh, and I'm that way with my, like, I don't. I, if I wrote a book about my parents, like, and I really wanted to get into it, uh, I could, I could, uh, that could cause them great shit. Not really, but I could cause them. Uh, but I mean, it's like I don't like. Pe maybe when my parents, my dad passed away, but just like I, don't, I just don't like this idea where I'm so personal that it, uh, it, I can't get that personal where it affects my 
yeah. my family kind of. Although yeah. I can say, you know, horrible things about Alan Dershowitz. Yeah. And more, and I can say more fun things about my mother. Mm -hmm. But the therapy has brought up a lot of things for me, which I did not realize happened because I blocked everything out. You know, you don't remember things from your childhood. Do you remember a lot of things? Some things. Yeah. There's vivid memories that you hang on to, and some are good, some are not good. So the therapy and the Prozac, mm. I'm not, it sounds like I'm selling it. Uh, I did sign an endorsement deal with Prozac. <laughs> and, Re and Red Bull, interestingly enough. <laughs> Uh, but if you see Andy on stage, you'll know why he's. But no, it brings up these things, and you, you really. Uh, I, I, I thought that I was. You know, when you're Jewish, you just everyone assumes you've been in therapy. You know. Really. <laughs> and like obsessive compulsive. Well, obsessive yeah. compulsive disorder, right? Yeah. I was saying last night on stage, it is like, sounds like a delightful Jewish disease. It needs a it needs a more extreme name. Yeah. One of the things that I enjoyed hearing recently is how you got started doing the state of the industry at the Just for Laughs. It didn't start off that way. You kind of you were doing something else at, right. the, at the festival, and then somebody asked you, "Oh, can you just do this thing?" And it became the state of the industry. And maybe give back yeah. for anybody who doesn't understand, doesn't know what this is. Well, what I I've been going to the Montreal Just for Laughs festival since 1993. So I went in 93, and they didn't usually bring comics back unless they're like were really famous. So they, they didn't bring me back in 94, but they brought me back in 95, and I did this like uh, a, uh, an autobiographical thing. And then I did another thing where I demonstrated hack comedy because I'd written an article for National Lampoon called The Hack Comics Handbook, which is still on my website if anybody wants to see it. So um, Bruce Hills, I did a demonstration up there with like Pat Oswalt and all these comics like how to be a hack comic yeah. and it was really fun and then the Bruce Hills who was the head of the festival said maybe we should come back the next year and do another type of speech but as my manager came up with the name study of the industry and I mean it really is weird I had no idea it would go on how many years is it 30 years yeah. and, I, and I'm, I can retire just on my study of the industry money <laughs> And it's an hour long. It's like an hour long. It's in the hotel where the festival is. And the idea is to basically uh, criticize what I don't like in a funny way. Uh -huh. yeah. Or get very angry depending on the topic. <laughs> Have you, can you think of a, a, a year or an instance where you, you were really angry about yeah. comedy? Uh, not, well, I was always angry about, you know, like one of the things in the first speech was I offered a million dollars for footage of Whoopi Goldberg being funny. <laughs> So, but uh, I would always be angrier at the way the system was set up, maybe, and uh, you know. But going after specific comics became a thing that I added on, that I always kind of did, but was nervous to do it because it's like an unwritten rule. You know, oh, you can. It's not really a rule, but it's like you could do Michael Jackson jokes for days, but then don't bring up another comic or. I happen to like Michael Jackson, and uh, um, so how do you? How did you get past that? that <laughs> I don't know why I said that. I happen to like Michael Jackson. <laughs> how did you get past that? Where you were, you know, it's the unspoken rule of not going after. Oh colleagues? well, because because I'm compelled to get the stuff out of my head, and I'm. I used to think things were so black and white, like. I didn't realize I'm getting better at knowing there's gray areas of life. So if I'm going to go make fun of somebody, I have to be willing to accept that they're not going to like it. I can't have it both ways. Yeah. Uh, I do try to keep my targets high, and I try to keep the speech like a roast more than a really mean thing, but sometimes I'm very angry. Yeah. yeah. Have you had somebody come, come to you after and say, that was... that crossed the line? Well, like, I was never a big fan of Adam Carolla. So I made fun of him, and then he talked about it on his show. And when I made fun of uh, Opie and Anthony, they you know they found out about it and, the, and that kind of thing. But uh, has anybody ever come oh, to oh, you after and say uh, that was you crossed the line with me? I think yeah. But, well, like uh, 
when I uh, I've made fun of different people and then uh, like the agent uh, an agent will say oh they want to represent me because of it you know wow. but and I prefer to think yeah I think we're good I prefer to th oh you want more water it's, she knows she uh, knows what I I prefer to think uh, I prefer to think that uh, what was I doing <laughs> say it again one more time <laughs> you just edit all this stuff out yeah, or leave it never. in it could be no no, 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 no please no, leave I don't it edit. in no oh. uh, it's too hard to do uh, I, that's true <laughs> You know who you does edit? Yeah, Josh who? edits my podcast. Uh, I was gonna say, how yeah. Do you, how, how do you get a gig where somebody else is editing your? Well, he's in the stuff. podcast. Well, yeah. And he's you editing. You don't want to edit this for me? No, I, I can't stand <laughs> it. I can't, and I, I can't believe he, he does the work. Yeah. But it's different because it's a, it's a, not a comedy podcast per se, yeah. but he will edit out. You know, he can edit sure. it for laughs. Yeah. Okay, so third time's a charm, Andy. Yeah. Has anybody come to you saying that you have crossed the line? Okay, so yeah, that ma that agent who didn't hire me, and then uh, uh, when I used to make fun of Louis C.K., I know that really bothered him. And uh, I was making fun, as I say in my act, I was making fun of him before it was yeah. the, a reason to. Right. So, yeah. uh, but, but Louis C.K. would be somebody who I actually do think you know, regardless of the stuff that he ended up getting in trouble for, I do think that he was, he was generally kind of a manipulative kind of person who wanted to be powerful in a way and kind of could intimidate you. So yeah. he, I actually did get in, intimidated by him in a way because he came backstage to a show once right after I gave the speech. I think the bottom line is I can't stand confrontation. Um, and so... The interactions haven't been face to face, but like Opie and Anthony or Corolla would get angry at me. I, my bottom line is I'm always worried about getting beaten up. So I figure. But you never have. No, I've actually never been in a fist fight. Yeah. Because I was always very short, so I'd use my mouth to get out of it if I could. <laughs> so, you know, no, no real dan no real, no one's killed me yet. Yeah. The idea that I'm that I'm thinking about is you know, the, the agent who didn't want to represent you or who fired right. you. Do they really know you? Because if you were doing this this state of the industry and this was the thing that you do, did, and you're still picking up work left and right, you can't be that much of an asshole. Well, I think in this case. Sometimes things are a convenient excuse. So I don't think he was going to yeah. hire me because, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause, uh, you know, some of the big agencies are like, uh, what are you going to do for us? You know, they want to make a lot of money or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, they uh, they use it as an excuse. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. That's what I think. Yeah. If that guy really thought he could make money on me, he, he probably would have signed me regardless. Yeah. But because I'm, you know... I'm not like a, a dream, like a promoter's dream, uh, if you first see me, because I'm not trying to glad hand the crowd or whatever, like that kind of thing. But I'm never going to be a people pleaser kind of comic, you know? I mean, I think that's wrong. Crowd pleaser, are... crowd pleaser. Not people really? pleaser, yeah. Mm. Your crowd well, last night was pretty well, pleased. Well, that's the thing. My, my, my wife last night was saying she was amazed at the reaction. I, I cannot remember reaction that was that good so I thought maybe it was a trick <laughs> but um, you know if, if it hasn't been said uh, this was this was at the Paramount Theater Paramount which is Theater. a gorgeous large venue yeah it's nice um, I'm stunned that you you say that you've never gotten such a reaction positive well, reaction by the way Let's well here's the th here's the thing it's like do you hear the applause that Tig got when they before she even came out it's like they're when you go from your career being everybody's coming to see you, there is you almost can't get that kind of reaction until you have everybody come see you. Yeah. You know, I've had people come see me in, cl in clubs. I've done my own tours and stuff, but for some reason, it seemed to you know. I don't know. I don't. I hope this doesn't sound like I'm an idiot, but it did seem to be like louder than normal. Let's say louder than normal. But when I first started comedy, I didn't do well at all because I was I'm doing like what's considered inside things, and I never really had a constructed act like yeah. a people would be used to in the 80s and 90s. Is it the phrase, you're, you're playing to the back of the room? Yeah, now I was always playing to the back of the room, and I think that that's all my...
people I love, like Lenny Bruce, they're always playing the back room. And playing the back of the room is basically that you're doing a certain amount of material that uh, comics or the band are going to like because it's material about show business. Or it's, a bit, you know, it's like uh, if I'm making fun of the form. And in general, people like in Hollywood get nervous. Like, oh, well, do people know about that? You know, do they know that? So yeah. uh, it's just one of those things where I have to get used to now doing better. It's weird. I'm like, huh. like not you. I'm not used to it, and I used to do so much more self-deprecating material, which I, which is hard to do sometimes if you're doing well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So you, you've, you were doing stand-up. You're coming back every year uh, at Just for Laughs. You are a perennial favorite of Moon Tower. Have you been doing Moon Tower every, every year? I think year? I'm the only yeah. comic who's done yeah. it every year. Yeah. Uh, I'm first line of my introduction about you is you're the voice of Mort on Bob's Burgers. Right. I was surprised because what I like to do when I know I've got a, a guest coming up uh, you know, that I don't get to see at the open mics here in Austin, uh, I'll Google their name and podcast. I was surprised. How do you have time? How do you juggle your time? You've got podcasts, TV, you're do, you've got your particular show right. as well. How, yeah. How do I have time to what? To do all of the, these oh, things. Oh, well, I see. I don't think of myself as... You know, it's so weird. It's so funny because I think of myself as being completely unproductive, but this is also stuff I'm going through on therapy. Uh -huh. The thing that I'm going through with therapy is the only thing that I need to change... Not, not the only thing, but the I need to not motivate myself with anger at myself hmm. because it just doesn't work. So I'm, I... I uh, what happens is, since I, since I clearly have ADD, which goes along a lot with OCD, it just happens to go together, I, I got, you know, my dad passed away in January of 2015, and I became paralyzed. I couldn't do anything. I could barely write the speech. So it's more like, I love doing comedy, so I'll put myself any, in anything where I'm doing comedy, so like those opportunities are just there. But a lot of times, like uh, two years later, my taxes, where they owed me money, you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff that I'm working out yeah. that is a function of part of it's OCD when you check check your car, check your door, mm -hmm. that does something. But there's also, I have a fear of leaving the house sometimes, not like a agoraphobia, but yeah. close to it. So I actually feel like I do a lot of things, but none of them, none of them, I used to think I had to have a Christian work ethic type of thing, even though I'm Jewish. But it's like, I, I kept thinking, you have to be a person who wakes up in the morning and writes three hours. And as you get older, you get to be more comfortable with what your strengths and weaknesses are. It's like, yeah, it'd be nice to have a book, and maybe I will write a book, but if I'm just telling myself you have to write a book, it may not be the right thing for me. And so I'm, I'm trying to do things more, more, more organically. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, my wife has similar problems to me, like OCD. Not completely, but similar. So our goal is to have everything removed off of every surface in the house so we can think. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we're not, we're not hoarders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in like two days, the desk gets crazy and... Yeah. Can I share a personal story? Because sure. I just went through like a really rigorous spring cleaning, and I'll tell like you, a, 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 a literal. Yeah. Right. Yeah, where I said I have too much junk. If I and I'm same thing. I'm not hoarder level, but things that would just annoy me about when I want to dust, I have to move all this stuff, and I've purged so much from my kitchen countertops and my bathroom countertops. And I couldn't believe how therapeutic and great it felt. Now when I walk into the kitchen, now when I walk into the bathroom, it's like, clean surface. Oh my God, let's it, go. It works. It's crazy. It works because, you know, in my life, when I started comedy, I would save every article. Like if I was in a TV guy, I'd buy 20 of them. So it really comes home to, to hit you in the face 
when you realize you're spending like three hundred dollars a month on a storage unit. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I'm, we're spending three hundred, and a lot of that storage unit is filled with TV guides. So I am very conscious now yeah. of trying to make the, the decision not to keep things. Mm -hmm. You know, especially especially if um, it's there's no, it's not personal. Yeah. You know. Right. But I, I do that all the time. I will have these things like. And I look back six months later. You you stop seeing them after a while, mm -hmm. and but they do clog the mind up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I want to put out there is uh, um, how how nice, wonderful it is that you're so open about the therapy because uh, there are a lot of comics who self-admittedly say, "Oh, I'm you know, yes. I messed up in the head." But I've never had somebody that I talk to who's so forthcoming right. about it. I appreciate that, but you know, there's an up, up and down side to that because I tend to overshare. Uh, you know what I mean? It's like I never realized this about myself, yeah. but I've had to be careful now. Like, if I went in an audition and said, I didn't, I, I gotta hold the script while I'm doing the audition because I have OCD and I can't keep them. They don't want to hear that. Not everybody wants yeah, to hear yeah. about right. your OCD. And I'm not yeah. like saying you have to make rules, but sometimes I am trying to become a little bit more reserved, but not for any reasons why I'm scared to say things, just because yeah. I... But that, it is true that I, I do feel like I'm pretty open. And I also yeah. feel like... You ever see my dinner with... Andre? I'm sure you have. My dinner with Andre? Mm -hmm. To me, that was so affecting uh, affected me so much because the idea of just like two people sitting down and relating and yeah, yeah, yeah. and talking about world issues that's how I kind of yeah. see life so it's like I always am thinking about you know do you believe in God do I believe in God you know all these things that I do tend to think on those levels mm -hmm. Well, and then there's the element of the, the, the audience that's likely to listen to this. They're going to know who you are. They're going to think, oh, my gosh, Andy's you know, role model. And, hey, I know I've got issues. Right. You're giving them permission to, to get help. I think that is absolutely true. When you learn, when you learn that there are other people out there who have the same... <laughs> problems, whatever it is, it is really, I mean, when I looked in the uh, OCD, I read a book called Delivered from Distraction, and it's all about ADD, and when you look at the things in there, and you start to see the, the traits that all the people who have this have, you yeah. go, oh my God, it makes sense to you, you know, right. and I'm still in that mode where I'm trying to remember what, what happened when I was a kid, and I blocked a lot of things out because not because they were like awful traumas but because I just that was my attitude then was uh, don't pay you know like I was the youngest stay out of trouble mm -hmm. but then when you get older you realize you can't you have to start to bring these things out of yourself yeah. uh, it's funny there's a question that I, I will sometimes pull out of the of the hat to that says and I think this entire conversation has been you addressing some of this question so I'm going to ask the opposite question so my question is, is there something about performance that scares you? And I think you've, been, I mean, I think there's a lot that you've shared today that... You know, it's so interesting because it's like... That is the whole crux of the issue, uh, is when you get into your own head and you can't get out of your head, you know... That's why the stage has always been an opportunity for me to make breakthroughs. Like I made a tremendous breakthrough a few years ago, and what I thought I thought I was being very stream of consciousness, but I realized that I was having uncomfortable thoughts that I wasn't saying. Like whatever it would be, like, oh, I can't believe you're not laughing at the half baked premise I came up with three hours ago. So the more I said, I really need to give myself permission to say anything. Then it more and more people who relate to that. I think really, I like to hear that in other people. You know that they're similar to me that way. You know. What do you love about performing? I I love. Oh, first of all, I would say it's the greatest feeling. You know, I can't think of any creative thing that's better than being on stage when I'm really enjoying it. I love it. Yeah. Um, 
But the thing about there's like a as listening to this podcast, a, a philosophy podcast, and they're talking about uh, Buddhism, and Buddhism, it's not that you don't get attached at all. But it's that you 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 let it go, so that's what I'm kind of trying to do, is kind of uh, have more of a grist for the mill feel to things, and um, you know, trying to find my way. I forgot again. What, was it? what, was it? <laughs> what do you love about performance? Oh, okay. So <laughs> it's unbelievable. That I forget. I lose the thread. No. What I love about performing is when it feels great. But the Buddhist part is if you get attached to having a great crowd reaction every time you're on stage, yeah. and worse than that with a lot of comics who get attached to wanting the audience to love them. Uh -huh. See, I want the audience to love me, but I don't want to be a clown for them. I want them to love me for uh, my own, uh, for, for what I'm doing on my own terms. So the thing about stand-up is that or anything that you love, it's not going to be great every night. Yeah. It's not going, and I'm also at the point where if I don't want to go out, I won't go out. But uh, I have no boredom with it. It's like I keep learning things from it. It is the most natural thing to me. It is the most fun I, c I can imagine having in a creative pursuit. Yeah. So I do love, and the difference between, say, someone my age and other comics I've met before who are my age is like, I. I may be obsessed with getting older, just because I'm a uh, joke about everything, <laughs> but I don't believe that I'm out of touch or yeah, no. it's, uh, it's yeah. too late. Because I think that's one of the things that's, uh, there's a great article in the New Yorker this week about... Uh, uh, I won't be able to help you. I don't read the New Yorker. I'm sorry. Uh, what, was the, what was the general topic? This is going to be. Love. They're going to have. They're going to have me uh, uh, committed after this. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell us all. Right. Us. I, for, uh, I forgot. I lost the thread well, there. You, you said something that I wanted to uh, follow up on because I don't. I would not observe you as being out of touch. I mean, geez, you're on Twitter all the time. Right. No. That, but that's the thing. I'm not out of touch like that. Yeah. But a lot of. Com I, well, here's what I was going to say. A lot of these comics who get bitter. Not bitter like I am as a joke, mm -hmm. or <laughs> to get anger out, but they start to lose their love for stand up. And the reason why they do is because it has to be a current thing that you love. Mm -hmm. And that's what the uh, the article in the New Yorker uh, was about was about the con there's one part where he goes uh, that there's uh, we're taught to believe. If we do everything, you know, you follow your dreams and good things will happen to you. That's not the proper lesson. You're doing, you're doing it because you love doing it. And the, 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 the truth is, you can never know exactly what's going to happen. So I would be sad now if I was sick or ailing, but I don't think like I thought when I was younger, I have to be in a movie, I have to have a sitcom. And I also don't believe, well, it's too late for those things to happen because all of those things are incorrect judgments that we have from about life. Mm -hmm. Is that all of these ex expectations that we have uh, going... And if anybody gets the New Yorker, this guy's a really great... His name is Greenberg, Gary Greenberg. And he's just a really great analyzing the way we do things, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's why people aren't happy, is what I've noticed. Like people are always comparing their lives to what it was before, or it's too late, or all those things, and all of those things are myths. Or if I had had a sitcom, I would have had a better life. But now, and they ignore all the lessons of all the rich, fabulously rich people who didn't make them happy. I mean, the lessons are out there, but it's just natural for humans to want more and more and more. You know, so I never get bored. I. To say I never get bored doing stand-up is not correct because I do get bored sometimes. That's part of it. So if my expectation is I love stand-up and I'm going to keep doing it as long as every night it's pure joy, that's another. And so and that's the Buddhist part of like, let it go. You just let it go. You just don't get involved that much in the results. Yeah. You know. Yeah. People take that misunderstand Buddhism. I, I only understand it because I listen to this podcast. But people think it means you don't. 
nothing is real. You know, everything is equally unreal. But that's not what it is. It's like everything is equally happening. Yeah, so you being know? present, being mindful, yes. that whole concept. Do you do you want to tell the name of the this philosophy podcast that you've... Oh, okay. If you, um, this is a really great thing. It's called Philosophy Bites. Okay. And uh, it's with Nigel Warburton and uh, Dave Edmonds, not the, not the musician. And I just found it online and uh, I didn't even know what philosophy was. And even now, I still don't quite know what it is. Uh, but they have all of these different, it's the most fascinating field and I'm just uh, in love with it, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like they had a, a philosophy of what you should uh, do with monuments, uh, uh, how you should have monuments. Up. And it's like a way of life. I never, uh, I, I, I knew what the, you know, I knew there was a field, but I, I really feel like the, this whole thing of how science has of course, science is great, but how it's overwhelmed. This whole thing, I don't know exactly how it happened, but this whole thing, like, either you believe in God or you don't, or you're, an, or, or you're a group of people say you're an idiot to believe in God, and because of, where's the proof? Ignores this whole spiritual side of the universe. And I wasn't raised that way. I was raised with, like, Ken Kesey and, uh, L, you know, the LSD times and the 60s. We were all, like... Searching uh -huh. and yeah. looking for spirituality, and now I think this uh, uh, people are in their heads and they they don't know what spirituality or. is, and they just say come and uh, come and get me in spirituality. So I think it's uh, but kids, the kids today, the young kids like you, the eighteen year olds, uh -huh. yeah. the young kids today. I'm very excited. They're not. I thought it would get worse and worse and worse where they would just be so cynical, not believe in anything. Uh, many of them are, are spiritual. And they're finding their own ways to be spiritual. They're not the second event, second, I can't think of one Christian thing. The second Baptist, Protestant, I'm the wrong person to ask for that list. <laughs> you were, were you raised Christian? No, not really. Were you raised uh, non-denominationally? I was, yeah. But you see, that's the thing. I was, uh, I love my father. He's my hero. He's the funniest person in the world. But I had an unhealthy relationship with him because he was extremely, just in this one area, he was extremely smart. Smarter than me, for example. And he was agnostic, leaning towards atheism. And I had to realize that when I'm getting mad at these people, like the new atheists online who trash uh, Islam and everything, I have to realize that I'm getting even more upset with it because I'm still playing out this relationship with my father where I don't believe that my point of view is valid because he he knows more than me about yeah. it. And now, and, and that's oh, also because you want everyone to love you right, right. while having a spiritual, yeah. believing in spiritual. And I'm starting to get better and I hope by the time I'm 80, 85, 90 that I'll be able to be even more accepting of these things and not so angry about what I hate because if it's just if it's based in like Gervais getting under my skin I don't uh, uh, I don't want that like in, my therapist said to me once like that this you know Sam Harris uh, yes, yeah I, I can't yes. stand him but anyway he, I've been in a long argument with him and uh, he said something to me like he's defaming me and I said to my therapist it made me so mad and he goes he got you then he knew that was going to make mm. you mad so that's that's the thing I'm trying to learn is, you know, uh, in the in the era of Trump, where things can look bleak in a way. The, philo the philosophy part of it is, you can't live your life, worry that you're going to die every second, yeah. and you can have a way of enjoying things as they are, and and also being open to things. So. So I have a challenge for you, Andy. Sure. Uh, you have been coming to Moon Tower every single year, and maybe you you create a new show where you are the yogi to the Moon oh. Tower audience. Because I, I mean, what if, this has been 20 minutes on philosophy, and I've been riveted. I don't think I've said more than five words. Well, let me tell so. you something. Though. I, I um, any fans of your podcast, I know that I, I get information wrong. So, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, uh, or I get confused. Yeah. What, it's like, yeah. uh, what, like what that psychologist in the New Yorker was saying, it hit me like a 
bolt of lightning that people have been taught this thing incorrectly. Mm-hmm. Well, if you just, if you just, see, I think it's wrong that people don't follow their dreams. I think you should follow your dreams. I always encourage everybody. I want to be a stand-up, but I'm scared. You have to try it. You, you have to try it, and you have to allow yourself to do it. But it, it's the it's getting so interested in the results of it right. that's where you know it's like if you want to do stand up, enjoy it. Enjoy if you want to do stand up because you are, even though it's natural, we all want to be famous. We all want all of these things. But at some point, and age is good for this too. You just as you get older, you have less of that uh, yearning for stuff that's really to validate yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to come back as, uh, I used to do a character called Baba Andaji. Baba Mm -hmm. Andaji. Because I used to, uh, and it was like, you know, the leaf leaf in the stream does not know it has an appointment. (laughs) We are like the leaves in the stream. It's kind of a Krishnamurti type of thing. Yeah, I, I can see it. We are coming up on uh, our our wrapping up point here. This has been it's been a joy. Way more than I could have ever hoped and dreamed for. Well, now Speaking here's the thing. It's just a little. It's just a thing into yeah. the into why life is hard and how when you start to take understand what's going on yeah. and become an adult. It's like when I was told about the podcast. It's like sometimes I overbook things. And then I get to Austin and I get to enjoy anything. And then sometimes they go, it's 20 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And then I've had an hour where it's been terrible. But if it's an hour that you're enjoying, yeah. it's the greatest. Yeah. So it's like... So which it, one is... Which this one was great. Okay. This was great. No, because, you know, <laughs> the thing is, I'm, I want to be open to everything. But I have yeah. done an interview where you go into town and it's basically a kid who has a tape recorder. You know yeah. I mean? It's like... Yeah. It's like they don't really even know what they're doing. And then yeah. you sometimes have to value your time because you can't do everything. Right. But I'm glad that I did this. Yeah. No, I'm, again, many thanks to Bruce and your schedule being open for us. And yes. We are going the paparazzi, to, the paparazzi has paparazzi, not bothered us. Yeah, we've, uh, we've had the bodyguards keeping up those. Please, people, yeah, allow I me. Know. I come Please. to Austin because people allow me to be myself. Yeah. The yeah. mobbing. Yeah. The constant mobbing. <laughs> it's been... A, a great distraction, I have to admit. One word to describe your future. Wow. That's a good one. One word to uh, describe. Adventure. Adventurous. Yes. I don't know if that's the right. Yeah. Yes. I'm looking forward to the future. I used to think I was scared of death, but we're all scared of death. Yeah. But I've relayed this story to everybody who will listen. When I was six years old, I was in bed, and I thought I was dying because I had a hot, high fever. And interestingly enough, my mother was in, in her own world and didn't hear me yelling at her to the party below. Mom! And I'll never forget this. As long as I live, I actually believed I was going to die. And then I had the most peaceful feeling and I'm telling you I'm a nervous guy a lot and that really has stayed with me my whole life that I really do think that we're meant to be here forever even though we don't understand you know when Einstein said time was relative he meant time was relative he meant it's different for different people I really do think we're here forever I know that I don't know that for sure but I'm less the way I was when I was like 10 years old which was like I'm sure you had this too where you went where you realize you were gonna die, yeah. you know, before, yeah. after Santa Claus. And you, and I would just sit in bed and go, I'm gonna die, what's the point, I'm gonna die. I'm like, and now I realize it's more the fear of everything that, uh, uh, that right. and so since I don't know, since I really believe that the, the moment of me dying is going to be one of those calm things, I don't have to worry. I wanna live forever. I wanna live, but you think when I'm 80, I'm gonna go, that's enough? No, I'm gonna say keep going, yeah. and who knows when it'll happen. Yeah. I don't know if that's a positive yeah. message, but it works, it works for me. It's fantastic. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I'm going to give you one more chance in just a second. One to, more chance? To, to Have plug. I failed? No, no, no. To plug anything. Thought spiral. Everything. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, that is a wrap on Comedy Wham! Presents Andy Kindler. Oh, my God. I can't believe I'm saying sitting across. Still. 
Sorry for being makes me and the, and the, the fact that you're excited to see me is this makes is turning me around on myself. <laughs> Okay, tell us where we can find you on social media. Oh my gosh, the Twitter account. Yeah, Andy Absolutely. Kindler. If, yeah. if you, that I would say is my greatest achievement that will never <laughs> earn me a penny. Uh, Twitter has been most, my greatest achievement, also been the bane of my existence. It's an O, and if anybody suffers from OCD, yeah. it's an OCD oh, yeah. trap. Because if you're checking your door to make sure it's locked every time, imagine how much you're checking the interaction fresh, area to see how people are reacting. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Twitter is the main way. AndyKindler.com is still around, but I don't update it enough. And uh, Bob's Burgers, I'm Dying Up Here, is coming out later on in the year. Thought Spiral Podcast. And then just come by my apartment. And- <laughs> The address uh, is... Uh, at, oh, no, the address of it. I'm at Andy Kindler. Oh, no, I know. I knew you were. I knew you were. <laughs> Trying to one-up me again, Andy. No, I... Because uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, you know I don't edit, you know, so, Here's the thing. Know. I'm going to buy. take the bait. 555 Fifth Street is my address. All right. Box Fantastic. 555 Got in it. 555-ville. Ohio, and guess what the zip code is? Um, 32500. 55555. Wow. Wow. That's fabulous. Uh, We hope you've enjoyed learning about how Andy got to be the absolute comedic genius that you heard today, just as much as I have. Be sure to visit ComedyWham.com. Give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram, at ComedyWham, and like our Facebook page. You can listen to past interviews on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. Review us while you're at it. This has been Comedy Wham Presents, Andy Kindler. I'm Valerie, and that's been funny. Thank you, Andy. (laughs) This was great. I'm still, I'm I'm so obsessive compulsive. I'm like, I have to put my, my food away before the podcast, so let me ruin the ending.